have we got here then? We've got no glare here, or possibly no glare. So, or, you know, it might be a fallen standing stone. If it was, it's quite big. If this, if this had ever been upright, it'd be a perfect sort of still marker, you see. Mm. And it's in line with that big one at the back. Yes. Uh, we've had a good day today, you know, already, look. This is exciting, this is. Sort of thing that gets me off. <laughs> what surprised me about doing these, which I'd never really, I'd never really intended to do much of these. I thought it was just going to be coming out for a ride in the countryside um, with Dewey the archaeologist, and then you know, to learn something about them. But really, I thought I'd just do a bit of sketchbook drawing. I've been surprised at how they've gripped me and how they've inspired me. That was a massive surprise. But also in the way that my drawing of them is developing. Um, I mean, I'm going into some quite major abstractions with these. And normally I work with people, I work with life models, and I have a fairly realistic representational style. So doing this is, is a major departure for me. The, the boar hunt is a story from the Mabinogion. A guy wants the hand of a young maiden, but his horrible stepfather, who happens to be a giant, says, oh, you've got to do these seven tasks before you can have my daughter's hand in marriage. And one of them was to get the, uh, the comb and the shears that were between the ears of the Turchtruf, the wild boar which come from Ireland. The wild boar originally was a king that had been um, disgraced and turned into, turned by God into a wild boar. And he became become an incredibly nasty wild boar. He chased him to Ireland, he jumped in the sea and come to Wales. And this is where it gets interesting because it gets very topographically detailed. He arrives in Wales in somewhere near um, with Sands Bay, Kyrady, and then he crosses the Purcellies, he comes across Carmarthen, to Lawn, he crosses the Tav, and then he heads across Carmarthen up, up to the Slew and the Dufferin Valley, the Dufferin Hohor, to the Black Mountains, where there's place names for the for the boar, um, pe peppers the landscape. Well, I always mention the the clue I had with um, David Jones in the first place, where writing to the broadcaster and Iron Talvin Davis, he said, "If you were to read the story of the bow hunt from Caloch and Alwyn, with one eye on Cyril Fox's distribution of megaliths in South Wales, you'll see a pattern." And I'm basically that's what I've been doing for twenty years: is looking from the story to the map to the landscape. It's, it's almost like joining, you know them join the dot sort of uh, puddles. This is the, the dot across the river. And it, it's the first, first of a, a series of ceremonial monuments that heads toward the Black Mountains and roughly towards the midsummer sunrise. Is Arthur involved at this point? Um, go back and read it, Melvin. They, they, we haven't got to Cornwall, and, and Arthur's involved. Of course, he's uh, he's, cut, he's chased the bow from Ireland, and they arrived in um, St David's, and we followed the trail this far. Terrifying, absolutely terrifying. This is the scariest thing I've ever done. I'm, I'm absolutely terrified being up here. I just think I'm going to get blown right off this mountain. And it is a mountain. I mean, it's terrifying. Well, this was a sacred space. This, this rock is like air's rock to them, wasn't it? <coughs> it's a... Mine. 
So how long is it taking us to get here? I don't know, an uh, hour and a half. At several stages I thought I was going to die. Do you think you suffered for your art then? Do you think you suffered for your art then? I heard you, I was oh. trying to think of a polite reply. <laughs> what do you think? Very spectacular, but quite difficult to reach. Of access, well it, it depends which way you, you would um, approach it of course. I mean if you come up the, um, the concrete World, World War II, uh, you, could, you could get a tank up here, you often did of course. Um, but we did come the more difficult way, I'm afraid. You think it would have been built here for the view or? Definitely for the view. And the, the, the fact that I think these are very early in the sequence. Um, I think Neolithic people still remember that voyage from the continent where they brought the, the tools of agriculture, the, the goats, um, the sheep, the things that were never indigenous to Britain before they, they arrived. The emma wheat, the barley, the grains that they um, were cultivating. So I think they, they had this sort of um, sense of this is the ancestral sort of journey across them seas. The burial sites are definitely uh, places of memorial. Um, so that's an added inference. Something like this is probably more of a way marker or a, an astronomical monument. But I still am coming more and more to the conclusion that whether they're burial or standing or way markers, they're still environmental art. British Isles would have been like the Amazon jungle in them days. It's been a very dense forest, deciduous forest. The only incursion into that would have been the movement of large mammals through the landscape. They were in turn followed by Mesolithic hunters who um, gathered firewood they slashed and burned, and later the Neolithic farmers done the same, slashed and burned along these tracks. So the, the trail starts with large mammals moving through the landscape, uh, ends up as um, trails through the landscape. These become the early settlement places, and they, 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 they in turn become sedimented by monumentality. That's where they put standing stones up and monuments. And that's how you can still follow the trail of ancient migratory paths of animals by looking at the standing stones from the from the so this, this, early Bronze Age. Is there anything about the positioning of these then that's uh, that's relevant? Well, they mark midsummer sunrise. Isn't isn't that enough? Isn't that clever enough here? How far apart are they? Is that? And could you have done it if you were there at that time? Ah. How protective would they have been of, of these then? So, say so you're not from the, a local tribe, and you're kind of coming along, and you, you suddenly come across these. Are they? Are they? Are they I'm saying, get off my land. He'd ask me these questions. It's impossible to answer. Isn't it? I mean, I, I, I might be older. Uh, no, but you know, <laughs> five thousand years is a bit kind of beyond my remit. Um, but I imagine they they did have a kind of a a, a totem, totemic valley. They were uh, um, they w would have been seen to be belong to the tribe that put them up. The final destination, as far as I'm concerned, is the Black Mountains, which is peppered with uh, turf rivers and upper Kumtush and. Um, and all the way along there are, but because pigs have been domesticated and part of the, the landscape for so long, you see it's hard to tell which is which. I know for a fact that um, place names continue regardless of, uh, of change around them. The Isle of Col in the Outer Hebrides is a, a completely bare island 
The name Carl means hazel. When Mayburn was excavating there, he found a massive um, cache of burnt hazelnut shells where they were almost industrially kind of processing hazel into a kind of a peanut butter type of uh, roast confection concoction. So the island must have been covered with hazel back in the Mesolithic. The name still tells it. it historically, it's been a bare island. So the Mabinogion could simply be a just another version of, of a very, very old. Well, that's what I'm beginning to think. It's a fossilization of a kind of a, a Celtic songline, landscapers narrative story that goes back to remotest antiquity. Certainly the early Bronze Age. Yeah. Archaeology is quite a wide <clears throat> field, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, and a lot of it is about, um, well, digging up bones and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Does that not interest you as much? Well, I've done field ar archaeology and I find it, I mean, it's, it's part of what we do. But I, I've got a kind of what I call a phenomenological approach. I'm looking at the stones in the landscape and how they fit in with the landscape and how they relate to natural features like springs and... Um, and then and, and astronomical features like where the sun rises and sets. I found the, the rotten Romans all the bureaucrats. I didn't find them at all interesting, whereas these are more kind of um, shamanic and kind of um, more like uh, Aboriginals, India, American Indians, kind of. Uh, they're, they're inscrutable. They weren't scrutable. We knew exactly what the Romans were up to. No good. And bureaucracy and political power. Um, Is it the mystery then that's the draw? Well, it started off with, with, with mysteries. We called it Earth Mysteries, with ley lines and kind of uh, all sorts of things like that. I soon dropped all that, like, them ideas because I found that the, the very culture that they represented was mysterious enough in itself without having to kind of invent kind of new age uh, ideas for, for, to, to sort of explain them away. I've always been fascinated by ancient art. Um, I'm fascinated by the cave paintings in France and Spain. And when I travel, I try and find ancient art. I was led to some um, extraordinary at least Neolithic, possibly Mesolithic rock carvings in Pakistan a few years ago and also some rock carvings in um, Idaho in the USA uh, which are thousands of years old. I've always thought of ancient art as paintings or carvings, even little statues and it's only recently it's occurred to me that the, the, the stones we have across Wales, across Britain, across Western Europe are the mark of artists on the environment. And the other thing is I've been looking at art, ancient art in other countries and ignoring my own heritage. This is my heritage and I haven't really paid much attention to it and I guess it's time that I did. I think there's something, uh, something reawakening in kind of a uh modern urban man that we kind of we look into our past for a sort of something poor, something kind of worthwhile we're not going to last forever as individuals or as a society or as a civilization and i think what we leave behind what i leave behind as an individual and what our society and civilization civilization leaves behind is becoming more important to me now a funny thing, I went to a funeral the other day of a boy and uh, he started he started drinking like I did when he was young and at about the same time as I started looking at these stones he, he retired to his uh, mother's attic room and drank himself to death. It's a possibility that he's done the same thing. <laughs> when I got up the mountain with my... Uh... 